please open to John 13, and we're going to read verses 6 through 17. So John 13, 6 through 17, and let's stand with me, please. Let's read this together. Beginning in verse 6, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Let's pray. Again, Lord, thank you for uh, your word and this portion of scripture. And uh, as we learn to wash feet, Lord, help us to uh, just put this into practice daily, Father, to be your servant to a lost and hurting world. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So please be seated. John 13, 6 through 17. That you may know the importance of washing feet. You may know the importance of washing feet. We'll look at this in four parts. One, verses 6 to 8, let Jesus wash your feet. Two, John 13, 9 to 11, let Jesus decide what needs to be washed. Thirdly, wash another's feet. And then finally, we learn washing feet is a blessing. Washing feet is a blessing. Okay, let Jesus wash your feet. So last week... We spoke about, and, and that was the beginning of this, of this portion of Scripture, and, and really, I, I think I mentioned last week how chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and parts of 18 are what's called the upper room discourse. Remember that? And how the night before Jesus would go to the cross, how he spent this time speaking to his disciples, and I... I told you how it was sort of like a coach talking to his team before they played the game or a general talking to the soldiers before they went out on the battlefield. And that's the idea here. And it's interesting how John spent so much time, so much, so many words, so many chapters just on that short period of time, the, the Last Supper or the Upper Room Discourse, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so many lessons learned. And, and today we learned the lesson of washing uh, one another's feet, letting Jesus wash us, and just what that means, and, and how sometimes people don't want to let their feet be washed, and how that is a, a sign of pride in their lives. They'll, they'll keep things hidden and undisclosed, and then all of a sudden you, you learn about it, you find out, and you go, Lord, have mercy. You know, all this stuff going on, and because of their pride, they don't want to ask for help. And, and it's difficult for them then to have their feet washed, and then they're not washing any other's feet either because of that. Uh, and so we'll learn all that uh, here. It's been said that there are two water basins in life. Uh, One was used by Pontius Pilate when he washed his hands of of Jesus. He asked for, bring me a basin of water. And he said, he he actually washed his hands and he he said, I'm washing my hands of what is going to be done to Jesus Christ. And the other basin was used by Jesus. And he used that to wash 
someone, other people's feet, specifically the disciples. And, and it's the difference between self-preservation and self-sacrifice. Two basins in life. Which one are you using? Are you using the one to preserve your life or are you using the one to make a sacrifice and to wash other people's feet? Uh, so let's look at verse 6. He came to Simon Peter. Now, Jesus had already wrapped the, uh, a cloth around him or a towel around his waist. He had already got the, the, the basin full of water and, and now he comes to Peter. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And so Peter is, is wondering what in the world is going on here, right? Why is Jesus washing feet? Now, he understood that in that culture, I mean, when you enter a home, your feet should have been washed. There should have been a servant there washing one another's feet. But nobody, there wasn't one there at the door to greet them as was the custom. And so then their feet were dirty. Now, none of the other disciples thought about washing each other's feet because they had previously been speaking about who was the greatest. We learned that from the Gospel of Luke. They had been arguing among themselves, who's the greatest, you know, and am I the greatest? In fact, the parents of, of, uh, of John had had asked Jesus, or, or the mom had asked him, "Is it can, can my son sit on your, uh, on your right and left hand? Jesus said, that's not for me to give, right? They can't do that. And so people were, they were, they had this idea of, of being important and stuff. And Jesus, in a sense, is telling them, let me show you what it means to be important in the kingdom of God. Let me show you how you do this and, and how it comes to being. And so Peter is asking, Lord, do you wash my feet? Now, Peter is known for, for many things in Scripture. Sometimes he got them right. Sometimes he got them wrong. Uh, and we know that. He wasn't shy about saying stuff. One time in the Mount of Transfiguration, in, Mount, in uh, Matthew 17, uh, Peter was there. Uh, with James and John, and Peter said, you know, it's good that we're here. He really didn't know what to say, but that's the first thing that kind of came out of his mouth. It's good that we're here. Uh, he was there when uh, Jesus had told him, I'm going back to Jerusalem, and, and I'm going to be killed, even though he didn't quite understand that. And Peter said, oh, no, you can't do that. And Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan. Right? You don't know what you're, you're talking about. Uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was Peter who took out the sword and cut off the ear of Malchus. And here now, he tells Jesus, uh, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answers him in verse 7. Jesus answered, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. So Jesus understood that Peter didn't understand. Right? What I'm doing now, you don't know what I'm doing, which maybe is, uh, is the way the Lord sometimes deals with us. Something will be going on in our life, and we'll question it, and we wonder, why is this happening? Right? And so maybe Jesus is telling you, what I am doing now, you do not understand, but afterward, you will understand which means I'm not going to tell you, okay? Because you don't understand it. But maybe later on, when you grow and you mature a little bit, you'll understand. But right now, you're a little bit bewildered. You're a little bit confused. You're, why is this happening to me, Lord? You know, or whatever it may be. And you're like wondering, and why don't you just tell me? And it... You just need to trust him. You just need to trust him. And sometimes he'll tell you, sometimes he won't tell you. And there are people who think, well, I got questions, you know, when I get to heaven. I, well, you won't ask him any questions when he get to heaven. That'd be a, that's an absurd idea. He'll just be like. <laughs> so Jesus tell him, you will, and they were, the disciples at this point were a little bit spiritually 
dense, right? They didn't quite understand what was happening here. And then Peter says something in verse 8. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share in me. Literally, it could be translated as such, you shall by no means under any circumstances wash my feet. No, never. Never. You're never going to wash my feet. Now, some may think, wow, you know, I, I think I think Peter just is being humble here. He's just being humble, telling Jesus, no, you don't wash my feet. Well, it, it's not really humility because uh, we understand that when you're actually telling God what to do, that's not humility, okay? When you're telling God what to do, that's not a sign of humility. That's a sign of pride. And notice what Peter said. And this was common, a common thing with Peter. Peter would tell God what to do. And some people try to tell God what to do. No, you need to do it this way. Or these are my plans. You need to bless them. Right? It's like, well, who's God? Are you God or is God God? Who's in people try to be God in their own lives? And so you don't tell God what to do and call it humility. Uh, in, a, in a few months from here, in Acts 10, we see the Lord ministering through Peter. And this was after Jesus had already gone to heaven and the church is beginning. And in Acts 10, 9 to 15, I want to show you what Peter says and does. There's this vision of a huge sheet let down from heaven. And it says in verse 9, Acts 10, Peter, get up, kill, and eat them. And Peter doesn't say, okay, Lord. Now, what does he say? Not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything unclean. Right? Not so, Lord. And the idea is, and I've said it before, you never say no, Lord. The words no and Lord don't go together. It's an oxymoron. It's always what? Yes, Lord. It's never no, Lord. You may say, why? Because once you say no, then he's not your Lord. He's not your Lord. You become the Lord then. So he tells you to do something, you go, no, Lord. No. He's not your Lord anymore. You're, you're the Lord then. So it's always, yes, Lord. If he tells you to jump, what's the answer? How high? How many times? How far? It's not, no, I don't want to jump, or I don't feel like jumping, or my knee hurt. No, it's none of those things. And so get that out of your mind. You see, Peter didn't quite understand that. And sometimes humility is, is misunderstood. People think humility is oh, woe is me. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just no good and, and I can't really do nothing and, 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 and that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's me. That, that's not humility. That's uh, I won't say what that is, but that's not humility. Okay? What's humility? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is actually not thinking of yourself at all. You don't think about yourself. And I can guarantee you, most of your problems are because you think of yourself way too much. You are consumed with your thoughts. And consumed with yourself. And that's the reality of it. So what do you need to do? You need to humble yourself. You need to stop thinking about yourself so much. And I say it again and again and again. You know, and it's, you're complaining, you're upset, you're whatever. What you, all you're doing is thinking about yourself. 
You need to learn some humility and stop doing that because you won't be able to wash any other people's feet. So Jesus answered him. Notice, look what Jesus says. If I don't wash you, you have no share with me. I need to wash your feet. Otherwise, you and me have no communion whatsoever. You don't let me wash your feet. You know, it, it, it's you have no share with me. Peter needed his feet washed, right? He had preached the news. He had cast out devils. He needed his feet washed. He had seen what happened at the Mount of Transfiguration where Moses and Elijah was there. He needed his feet washed. Peter walked on water. He still needed his feet washed, which means you and I need our feet to be washed. It's very important, isn't it? Because you will have no share with Jesus if you don't let him wash your feet. If you don't let him cleanse you. So let Jesus wash your feet. Secondly, let him decide what needs to be washed. Look at verse 9. Simon Peter said to him, Now he has, oh, now I get it. Right? Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So his understanding, well, just give me a bath, you know. If you're going to wash my feet, hey, I'll just be more blessed. Just wash all of me, my hands and, and my feet. And now he's again telling God what to do. He goes from an objection to an overreaction, doesn't he? And so humility begins then, not with giving service, but with receiving service, with receiving service. And like I said before, sometimes it's hard for people to say, I need help. It's hard for people to say, I need help. They will hide stuff. And, and I guarantee you, in, in, in the church that we have, there are people's lives that there is stuff going on. I'll hear of stuff all of a sudden, and I'm like, Lord, have mercy. They haven't told anybody. They haven't asked anybody for prayer. And, and their lives are in turmoil. Turmoil. The kids are all messed up. The family's all messed up. It, I mean, it's one thing after another, and I'm like, they're at church thinking, oh, I'm okay, you're okay. You need to ask for help. You can't be so prideful not to ask for help and not to receive help. It reminded me of a story how this, this man who came to know the Lord and, and his wife didn't believe it because he started serving her. And she was like, who's this, you know? Or, or what happened to you? I came to Jesus. Because, you know, the dude was a, was horrible before. And all of a sudden, he came, and she's like, yeah, I don't know, man. There's, there's something going on here, you know? You, know, you just you don't want it took her some time to before she could come to realize, I guess this is true. She had trouble believing and trusting. So what does Jesus say? Well, Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. So Jesus is telling Peter, you don't need to wash. Your whole body doesn't need to be washed because you've already been bathed. You've already been bathed. You, you've taken a bath. What spiritually speaking, what Jesus is saying is, if you come to me, if you receive me as Lord and Savior, you have been bathed. Okay? Your sins have been cleansed. You've been, they've been taken care of. You've, you've taken the bath spiritually. You don't need to take that bath again. 
In other words, you don't need to be saved again and again and again. You know, it's like you asked the brother, how many times you've been saved? Oh, around 10 times, you know. Wasn't sure the first one took. I just went up again and again. I mean, you don't need to be saved again and again and again. You don't need to be saved one time. One time. Now I know there may be some people who look at you and say, no, you need to be saved again. <laughs> uh, first one didn't quite take, bro. You know, we, we need or you need, you know. No. And, and the word for bathe here me is luo, and it means to take a total bath. I mean, to immerse yourself totally in water and soap, to be totally bathed. And the word for wash is just nip to. This means just a spot cleaning, so to speak, right? A spot cleaning. So practically what was happening? Well, practically, uh, as they walked around and, and went to Passover because of their sandals and, and the dirt roads, I mean, it was dust, it was dirty, their feet got dirty. So they'd come into a home and their feet would be washed, but they had already been cleaned. Spiritually, what, what does it mean? It means once you give your life to Jesus, your, uh, your sins are forgiven. Right? Past, present, future. But, have you noticed that once you give your life to Jesus, sometimes you still sin? Have you, have you figured that one out yet? You still sin. So what do we need to do with that? We need to confess our sins, right? 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins, and he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, our feet still get dirty, so to speak. And so our feet need to be washed. And what happens is, if you don't wash your feet continually, well then, the communion you have with God will break down. That communion just breaks down. And sin will set up a barrier then between you and the Lord. And Isaiah 59, 1 to 2 says it this way. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it can't save, nor his ear heavy that it can't hear. But your iniquities have separated yourself from God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You need to let me wash your feet, Jesus is saying. So that we can have communion together. That we can be together. We need to be like King David in Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways and see if there's anything wicked in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Our feet get dirty. We need to come to Jesus daily to ask him to cleanse our feet. But notice Jesus kind of alludes that there's one here that's not going to happen for, but not every one of you. And he's speaking of Judas Iscariot, right? Not every one of you. Verse 11, for he knew who was to betray him. And I'll just give this short little note for, for next, not next week. The following week, the following week we'll be speaking about betrayal. And so if you've ever been betrayed, it'd be a great message because truth, everybody's been betrayed. And what do you do? And, and you know what happens many times, especially when it happens at church, people are betrayed, they don't go to church anymore. They don't go to church anymore. They leave the church, and they, they stop going to church. But I think we'll learn the lesson that, you know what, you, you have to keep going. You have to keep going. Who was betrayed? Jesus was betrayed. Yet he continued. He, he washed Judas' feet. He continued to serve him. So, for he knew who was to betray him. So, a little note there. Next week, actually... Uh, Oscar and Liz will be here, and Oscar will be sharing with us. Uh, that, quiet, that was 
why he said, not all of you are clean. So he knew that Judas was going to be the one. He knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. You know, and it's interesting. You look at the life of Judas, you wonder, the disciples didn't even know, right? I mean, Judas had been there all those past three years. He had seen Jesus heal people. He had seen Jesus do incredible stuff. Judas used to take care of the money bag. He was the treasurer. He would give out the money to, to help the poor. And, and when Mary poured that expensive you know, amount of perfume on Jesus' feet, he said, Hey, let, let's, uh, we, sh- we could have sold it and, and give the money to the poor. But he wasn't real. He was a hypocrite. He was phony. Matthew 7, 21 says, this is the New Living Testament, not all people who sound religious are really godly. They may refer to me as Lord, but they still won't enter the kingdom of heaven. The decisive issue is whether they obey my Father in heaven. And so what's another thing here then? Well, the idea is this. It doesn't help to get your feet washed if you haven't had a bath to begin with. Right? A lot of religious folk come to church, do do all the religious stuff. They haven't had a bath yet. Their feet are getting washed, but they haven't had a bath. It doesn't help. You need to come to know Jesus Christ. You've heard of of the outlaw Jesse James before. You know what Jesse James used to love to do? Go to church. Love to go to church. One day, he killed a person in a train robbery. What did he do that day? He went to church. Went to church that day. In fact, Jesse James would say, I love Sundays. I love going to church. Another day, another bank robbery, killed two people. What did he do? He joined the church choir that day, that same day. It's a homeboy sitting up here. Now, I'm not saying nothing, you know, I'm just, just as we look around here, you know, homeboy sitting up here. Maybe one of the singers, I don't know, maybe, you know, I don't know who it is, sitting up here. Oh, Jesus, you know. Really? Let Jesus decide what needs to be washed. Thirdly, wash one another's feet. Wash one another's feet. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? And I don't know if they did. I don't think they quite understood that then because, remember, they had just walked in arguing about who's the greatest. In Matthew twenty twenty one, it reads, and he said to her, what do you want? And this is Mother James and John. She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus said, in Matthew twenty twenty five to 26, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Let him be your servant. Notice how Jesus responds, verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. Jesus saying, I'm the head chief, okay? I'm the teacher, I'm the Lord, and you're right. That's who I am. Do you understand? If I then, verse 14, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, and I think he might have paused here just waiting, you know, can you finish the sentence? And they probably were like, 
If I then wash your feet, you also have to wash one another's feet. Okay? Don't be such a bonehead here. This is basic theology. This isn't some mystical kind of thing. I don't understand it. No. You need to wash one another's feet. You also ought... Jesus washed feet. So Jesus is saying, I'm Master, I'm Lord... What is that? You should be washing feet then. Oh, that's what, what does disciple mean? Well, to follow, right? To be like, you want to be like Jesus? You wash feet. Now, we don't have a foot washing ceremony. I know some places say we're having a foot washing thing, which is fine, I guess. I mean, you know, whatever, all right? Whatever. And I, I, one time in a, the uh, in Albuquerque, the, the youth leaders we used to have youth meetings, youth leader meetings, and and one meeting I remember one of the youth leaders said, "I'm going to wash your guys' feet." Literally. So he brought a basin and and he washed our feet. He brought lotion and you know some like good smelling stuff and it's like. Cool. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. So it's not a ceremony uh, to wash feet, but the idea is to serve somehow, to be a servant. Because spiritually speaking, remember, people's feet get dirty. Their lives then are what? Sinful. And they need to be cleansed. Right? And Jesus wants you to help to cleanse them. You see, we could respond, man, your feet are dirty. Man, look at your feet. You know, you could, you know, what, what are you saying? You're, you're, you're sinful. You're living a sinful life, right? Your feet are stinking dirty. Literally, you know what I mean? They're dirty and they're stinking. Your feet are stinking. You got some dirty feet. That's how some Christians react or respond. They'll, they'll look at a person and say, you got dirty feet. Look at that person. And what does Jesus want you to do? He wants you to wash their feet. You understand that? Instead of pointing them out, saying, they have dirty feet. He wants you to wash their feet, to bend down, stoop down in humility, and wash their feet. But all some people can do is say, you have dirty feet. And they're looking at everybody. You got dirty feet. You got, you got dirty feet. No, you need to wash people's feet. So some people criticize and still wash it. Now, so as we learn about we're supposed to wash one another's feet, guess what? Washing feet is a blessing. Really? Yeah. It is. Why? Because it says so. Okay? I'm just telling you, that's, that's the easy answer, because it says so. Look at verse 15. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. So Jesus said, I'm the template. I'm the example. He is the, theologically speaking, the apothesis. Something like that. Apothesis. What, it, what does that mean? That word means the supreme example. The supreme example. Okay, Michael Jordan might say, I'm the apothesis of basketball. Jesus is the apothesis of everything, and especially of servanthood, right? I'm the example, I'm the model, I'm the template. If I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger Another word for messenger is what? Apostle. Nor is an apostle greater than the one who sent him. 
So it's never, no, Lord. Right? It's never my way. It's always His way. It's always His way. And what does He say? If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed. That's another word for blessed. Oh, how happy. Oh, how happy. Blessed equals happy. Oh, how happy. Blessed are you if you do them. The principles is real simple. Humbleness equals happiness. Humbleness equals happiness. What does pride bring? Bitterness, anger, so on and so forth. Ugliness, let's just call it, okay? That's what pride does. Humility, humbleness brings happiness. So how should we wash feet? Gently, right? Gently. Uh, Galatians 6 1 brethren if a man is overtaken in a trespass you who are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness considering yourself lest you also be tempted because there are people who wash feet they use cold water to wash feet right let me wash your feet <laughs> You know, and you're giving them an ice bath, right? And there are people who wash feet and they use what? Boiling water to wash feet. I'm going to boil that sin off of you, brother. <laughs> I'm here, you dirty, rotten sinner. I'm going to boil you clean. Come out. In Jesus' name. So we need to be humble. We need to we need to have our feet washed, first of all. Make sure your feet have been washed. Well, really, first of all, make sure you've been bathed. Right? Make sure you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because if you're just religious, it doesn't do you any good. You need to be bathed. You need to have received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now he's your Lord and Savior. And then you need to have him wash your feet continually. And you need to be humble enough to say, my feet need to be washed. My feet need to be washed. My life is in turmoil. My family is messed up. I'm scared. I'm afraid. I'm fearful. I don't know what to do. Can someone help me? And then the brothers and sisters will come around and pray. But we don't know. And then all of a sudden, it just, you know what happens? It explodes. And after that, you can start washing feet. I want to read you a little story about, have you heard of the Velveteen Rabbit? You've heard that before? Let me read you a little part of it. It says, the skin horse had lived longer in the nursery than any of the others. He was so old that his brown coat was bald in patches and showed the seams underneath. And most of his hairs in his tail had been pulled out to string bead necklaces. He was wise, for he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive to boast and swagger, and by and by break their mainsprings and pass away. And he knew that they were only toys and that they would never turn into anything else. For nursery magic is very strange and wonderful. And only those playthings that are old and wise and experienced like the skin horse understand all about it. 
What is real? asked the rabbit one day when they were lying side by side near the nursery fender before Nana came to tidy the room. Does it mean that things inside of you, uh, that they buzz and, and you have a stick-out handle? Real isn't how you're made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, and then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he is being truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up? He asked her bit by bit. It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all. Because once you are real, you can't be ugly. Except to people that don't understand. You understand that? If you have sharp edges, if you, you know, if there's things that, that God needs to deal with, he needs to deal with them. Then once he deals with them, you'll be able to be real. And you'll be able to wash feet. And it won't matter. How dirty some people's feet are. Sometimes people come in with some pretty dirty feet, don't they? God wants us to wash their feet. Amen. Let's pray.